We're so excited you're here. Hey, what's up, church? Hey, let's stand to our feet this morning. Good morning. Good morning, everybody online. Hey, I'm so glad you guys decided to be here today. Hey, let's put our hands together, all right? Come on. Oh, let's praise our God today. Let's sing it out. I praise in the valley. Come on. And praise on the mountain. Yeah. I praise when I'm sure. And praise when I'm doubting. Oh, that's good today. Come on. I praise when I'm numbered. Yeah. Praise when surrounded. Yeah. Praise is the waters. My enemies drown in. Come on, see you As long as I'm breathing. Got a reason to praise the Lord of my soul. I'm gonna praise the Lord of my soul. Oh, come on, see that. I praise when I feel it. Come on, and praise when I don't. Yeah, I praise because I know you're still in control. Yeah. My praise is a whip, it's more than a sound. Yeah, my praise is the shout that brings Jericho down. Come on, as long as I'm breathing, I got a reason to praise the Lord. Oh, my soul. Call 
upon his name today, church. Come on, let's sing it out. And oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh, it's that simple. Come on. And oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness. On your faithfulness.
praise Him today, church. Praise Him today for His goodness, for His faithfulness over this place, over your lives. Come on. I mean, that's so good today. And the sacrifice that Jesus gave to us, His life. We're about to sing about that. So let's praise Him. In the darkness, we were waiting with our hope with our life till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt such a humble beginning for our king come on let's praise him right now Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit. Lift it up, church, come on.
church, he wants to hear your voice this morning. It's that simple. Come on. Cause for you can go ahead and have a seat where you're at. If you don't know me, my name's Dane. I'm one of the pastors here on staff. And over the past couple of years, I have learned a lot about love that I didn't think that I didn't know. And a lot of that is because uh, my daughter Tyler was born. Here's a picture of her. Uh, she is, uh, she just turned two. There she is. Yeah, she's really cute. Don't let it fool you. Okay. She's very cute. And she just turned two a couple of weeks ago, and she's a blast, and I truly love her so much. But she is testing my love at the same time. <laughs> and uh, so literally the past, like, couple of days, she has been waking up in the morning before she's supposed to wake up, which is, like, not the best. Uh, but then, like, we will be laying down. It's, like, an, more than an hour before she's supposed to wake up. And we check the monitor. She's laying there so peacefully, so quiet. And then we will check the monitor. I'm not even exaggerating. 15 seconds later, she is standing up. She's taken all of her clothes off. And she has pooped in her diaper and has taken it off and is holding it in her hands. And I, I wish I was making this up. This has, like, been the past three days. She's, like, grabbed her poopy diaper and is just, like, holding it in her crib. So I look at that cute face, and I'm like... I cannot believe you right now. And I, like, truly, I am so frustrated at her, you know, because it's like well before we're supposed to be getting up and now she's wide awake and there's poop everywhere. And I'm having to like dive into this and clean her up and just get her like going for the day. And we're, my wife and I are just like, uh, you know, if you're a parent, you get it. You've probably been there. Uh, but I've learned a lot about love over these past two years because of those things. Because while she does that crazy stuff, and it really drives me crazy, my love for her does not change. My love for her, even in that moment that I want to kind of strangle her because she's put poop everywhere, uh, I truly love her, and that's why I'm going to clean her up, and that's why I'm going to, you know, help her <laughs> throughout the day and also pray that she sleeps. <laughs> she didn't again this morning, so it was wonderful. Uh, but uh, I, the thing that, I, that just stands out to me about that is that I believe we have a God who does that for us. I believe that we have a God who <laughs> comes into our mess that we have probably created and does not come in with frustration like I do, but comes in with love, comes in with care, and comes in with, with honest kindness because he loves each and every one of us so much. And so I'd, I don't know uh, if you, maybe this is the first time in this building or in a church in a while. If that's the case, I want you to know Jesus loves you. He loves you right now. If you've been in church your whole life, I want you to know Jesus loves you. I think sometimes uh, we honestly can forget that. And so today we're gonna take communion here in just a second. And I want it to be a reminder to us of what Jesus did, that he came into this earth 
a super messy place. He died on a cross, a super messy thing. But ultimately, he rose from the grave so that you and I can have hope today. So that you and I can have healing today. And so that you and I uh, can, can be clean from the mess that we made through our sin. So when you're ready, I want to invite you to take communion, to take the bread and the juice, and to invite him into your mess today, to invite him into what is going on in your life today because he loves you today. When you're ready, take the bread, take the juice. we praise you today for being a God who is with us, not a God who is distant, who's far off, for being a God who is present with us, not waiting for us to clean up or act, but a God who's with us in our mess. And so God, that's, we worship you today. We sing to you. We gather in this building today, God, to thank you and praise you for how good you are, for how you you work on our behalf, work in our lives, and for the love that you have for us. So Jesus, we, we worship you. We thank you today. It's in your powerful name that we pray. Amen. Well, you guys, I am so glad that you're here. Honestly, I'm truly glad that you're here. And today is a unique day because both of our campuses are together in one place. And for an unfortunate reason, uh, we had a flood at our Niwak campus, which is a huge bummer. Amanda will tell you a little bit more about that here in just a second. But I am thankful that we all get to be in one place. Usually we are a church that is one church in two locations, and today we get to be a one, one church in one location. I think there's beauty to that, seeing people from both campuses. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's awesome. It's fun to see people from both campuses here, and so I'm truly so glad that you're all here today and that we get to worship together in this way. And uh, I just want you to know also, if you're new here, if you had no idea about any of the stuff going on today, I want you to know we'd love to connect with you. We'd love to help make this place a home for you. And so you can go out to our new here table out there in the lobby, and we'd love to get to know you and hear your story a little bit and help get you plugged in here. Also, I want you guys to know we've been doing our Christmas tags at both campuses over the past couple of weeks. And actually our timelines for these things at both campuses are different because we have different partners at both campuses, but the idea is the same. That we want to serve and love on our community, especially people in our community that are in need this Christmas and holiday season. And so there's some details that go into that. For Frederick, all of you guys, we've already given out all of our tags and we're actually bringing those back. However, our NIWAC campus with some of the timing and the uh, just when our partners needed the tags and the gifts, we're actually still giving out tags. And so the cool thing is that both campuses can take advantage of this. And so if you have not been able to grab a tag, regardless of the campus that you normally attend, I would love for you to go out there. We have a bunch of different tags. They're from a partnership with Colorado Friendship and then also partnerships with our schools as well as just families in our community that we know are in need. And so as a church, regardless of the craziness that's going on here, we want to be a church that is for our community. We want to be a church that is constantly focused and looking to love people outside of our church. And so if that 
is you and you have not been able to grab a tag, we want to encourage you to do that. Go out there, and our team out there would love to connect any of the dots and answer any questions you have about any of that. So, guys, truly very, very thankful for you. Very glad that you're here. Stand up, say hi to somebody next to you. Maybe give them a hug, give them a high five, and just say hello. Good morning to all of you. How's everybody doing this morning? I think you could do a little better than that. How about that worship? Let's give God some praise today. If you don't know me, my name is Amanda. I'm one of the pastors here on staff. I just want to welcome everybody um, in the same room today together, everybody who's watching online today. Hope you guys had an amazing Thanksgiving. We had a a great Thanksgiving with our family, hanging out, and uh, happy to be at Sunday. But um, in case you haven't noticed, today is uh, not what we would consider a normal Sunday at Rocky. So I'll just address a couple things. First of all, um, in case you haven't noticed, no one's probably seen Matt Cody, our lead pastor around, which is a little bit crazy. We're all together and no Matt. Um, So last week, if you were here, you know Matt got up at the beginning of his time to teach, and he was like, hey, I'm a little sick. I'm going to teach with a cough drop in. Not feeling great. Asked for some grace last week. Well, unfortunately, uh, Matt got worse, not better. So... Matt is super sick. Um, So you guys can say a little prayer for Matt. Uh, He is definitely, definitely under the weather. He's been struggling all week with that. So Matt was scheduled to teach this week. And on Friday, he was like, I can't teach. So guess what? You get Amanda today. Um, Yeah, Not, not, not the plan, but we're rolling with it, right? Second thing that is unusual about today is like Dane said, We are all at one campus. I mean, typically we're meeting at uh, two campuses, rolling with our NIWAT campus. And unfortunately, as you probably know from a text and email and social media, um, on Friday at about noon, um, the alarm started going off at Fred or at NIWAT, got a phone call, and we had a pipe that broke. And I, I brought it for you just so you guys could... (laughs) I just want you to live my life a little bit with me. How about that? Let's do this together. We're family. So this pipe that's big, as you can see, broke in half. So one part of the pipe was way down. A water shot so hard through two um, walls of sheetrock. This half of the pipe was uh, in the ceiling clear across the room. So this pipe burst. As you can see, like I said, I'll just set it here. You can look at it the whole time. Um, it, uh, definitely did some damage. So that big of a pipe, uh, we got there fast in about 25 minutes, but that was pumping about 3000 gallons of water for 25 minutes. So you can do the math. Um, so we have some significant damage at our NIWAT campus. So you can be praying about that. Um, it happened on the South end of our building. So our auditorium is okay, all intact, but, you know, we uh, lease our building to the school, so RMCA, it definitely destroyed their offices, classrooms, so they're displaced, and we have a big mess. So we have a mitigation team that's working um, over there, cleaning up. We've had some power issues um, kind of off and on through the weekend. All that to say, today was not a wise decision to meet in the NIWAC campus. So, We're thankful that we have a building, that we can all come together, that we can hang out. So not what we planned, but that's what we're rolling with today. So this is the point of both of those things. Turns out that um, life happens to all of us, right? Even if you work at a church, even if you're a pastor, if you're mad, (laughs) we still get sick. Life happens to all of us. And so, no, today is not what we planned, but I've reminded myself of this over and over in the past 28 or 24 to 48 hours. Um, I keep telling myself these things. No one was hurt in any of this. We thank God for that. 
All right, um, I told Matt, no one died, and I think Matt's still alive today. So no one's died. And yes, it's frustrating. We have a mess. It's a pain. But I keep reminding myself over and over, it's just stuff. It's just stuff. And coincidentally, we're in a series right now, kind of about money and stuff. And that's what we get to talk about today. So this is a perfect segue into our message. Because the thing is, when it comes to stuff, when it comes to our money, our possessions, we often have this idea that more is better. And this is natural for us because we, we're, we're immersed in this American dream culture. That's what we live for. We're always in the pursuit of more. We want more opportunities. We want more money, more status, more recognition, more stuff. It's kind of funny. We take a team over to Kenya, um, you know, to do our, our partnerships with Mohi. And sometimes when we're over there and we're among this community and so much poverty and they look at us as Americans and they know we have money. That's how we got there. We must have enough money to get there. In their eyes, we're rich. And they can look at us and be like, I want to live that American dream, right? They can get caught up in what we get caught up in. We want more. And this is the problem with constantly chasing more. It's this, that it, it actually promises more than it can ever deliver. It promises more happiness, more comfort, more security, more peace of mind. But as I was reminded again this week, it rarely delivers on those promises. So why do you think uh, so many of us, we, we live this American dream and we get a house and then it's like we want the bigger house, right? Or we want the new car or we want new stuff. And we expect that new stuff, that, that bigger house, it's going to bring us comfort, more opportunity to entertain, to have community. And we just get caught up in more, more, more. And here's a little confession. When my husband, Dee, and I got married 30 years ago, we actually, we lived in an 800-square-foot house with five kids, um, and we didn't have a lot. And I remember praying, we were, we were praying about moving, and I actually remember praying along these lines, God, if you just give us a bigger house, I promise we'll, like, we'll invite everyone over. We'll, like, we'll use this for ministry, we'll entertain, please just give us more. Like, that's what we get caught up in. We want more. But the reality is this, and some of you know this, you know this from life, it does lead to more, life does, it's just not the more that we expected. Because the bigger house that we get, it just leads to more maintenance, more time, more stress, right? And when we get more, we often realize we aren't actually satisfied. We get that thing that we think is going to fill us up, and it actually doesn't do that. Because here's the truth. It doesn't matter how much you have, there will always be be someone who has more than you. Always. Rich people have more, but you know what? They often worry. They worry more. They worry more about keeping it, about maintaining that, about what they have. So here's a question for you today. What if there was a better, more fulfilling way to live? We're finishing up this series, like I said, um, titled Be Rich. And a lot of people spend a lot of time trying to get rich, but we don't spend a lot of time trying to be rich. And if you missed last week, here's a few thoughts from Matt's message about being rich. First one is that you're, you're richer than you think. Even if you don't feel wealthy, you likely have more than most people in the world. Wealth has side effects. It can lead to arrogance and misplaced hope in money instead of God. And generosity is the key to being rich in a godly way. Giving counteracts the negative effects of wealth and it actually keep up, keeps us focused on God. And the reminders for us to be good at being rich, they're this. It's to acknowledge our wealth. We can't let this moving target of rich blind us to just the abundance that we already have. I mean, look around. We have so much much. 
And we need to put our hope in God, not money. True security comes from God, not our possessions, not our stuff. It comes from God. And we need to develop a giving plan. Intentional generosity, it prevents a lot of things. It prevents greed. It helps us use our wealth for good. That's what God calls us to. And we live, we live in this consumer-driven world, right? We're constantly bombarded with messages about needing more. Like I said, new clothes, new houses, new gadgets. But Jesus challenges us with this min- mindset. He wants us to ward against greed, and he reminds us that life is not about accumulating possessions. And actually, if we look at the Bible, the principle in the Bible, it's, it's actually totally countercultural. Instead of wanting uh, us to have more, it's actually about having less. Luke 18, says this, sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Acts 20, 35 says it is more blessed to give than to receive. Luke 9, 23, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. John 3, 30, he must become greater, I must become less. The truth is, when we loosen our grip on material possessions and we embrace this idea of generosity, we experience just this richness that no earthly treasure can fulfill in us. The kingdom of God dream, not the American dream, but the kingdom of God dream is about this. It's about less brokenness, less sadness, less poverty, less inequality, less fear, less judgment, less greed. It's about less of us and more of Jesus. The American dream says all eyes are on you. What do you do? What do you have? What do you look like? What do you drive? Where do you live? It's all eyes on you. And the kingdom dream says all eyes are on Jesus. It's about less of our money, our stuff, and our influence pointing to us. And it's about pointing towards Jesus, which is this is the caution for all of us. If we're not careful, our stuff can steal the spotlight from Jesus. In Luke 16, 13, it says, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And I want you to pay attention to that line for a minute. You cannot serve both God and money. And if we look at the Greek word for masters, it's this word kurios, which means one who is in charge by virtue of ownership. And that word, it's actually translated to the word lord. What Jesus is saying here is you cannot have two lords in your life. You can't serve both God and money. And this is the thing about this teaching from Jesus. And maybe you've heard that phrase before. Maybe you haven't. But if we actually put a blank where that word money is, God and blank, what would you fill that blank in with? Because I would argue that hardly anyone would fill that blank in with the word money. We want to fill it in with all kinds of other things. We can't serve both God and the devil. We can't serve both God and our sin. We can't serve both God and yourself. Rarely would we choose to say we can't serve both God and money. But let's be honest. It really comes down to in the real world, that's what Jesus says. You cannot serve God and your stuff, your possessions. Because the pursuit of more wealth and more stuff is the pursuit of something that you think will make your life richer if we have more of it. Jesus viewed money and the quest for more as the chief competitor for our heart. When we want more, it's just this competition. And the question that Jesus asks is this, do you have money or does your money have you? 
And you might be thinking this morning when I asked that question, my money doesn't have me because I don't have any money, Amanda. Because we get in that mindset. But I think it's a legit question. And I think it's interesting that it's so much easier for us to trust Jesus with our sins and our sorrows. We would rather go to him with that, that than we would, would go and, and give him our stuff. We don't want to give that over to him. I mean, when we mess up, we start praying right away. God, please forgive me. Please don't let that person find out what I did or didn't do. When something goes wrong in life, we start pleading with God. We're like, please save me, right? Please rescue me. Please don't let them die. Please save my kid from this. We start pleading with God in these moments. And for some of you in the room, you're not even, you might not even be someone who regularly prays to God. You might like, I don't even know who God is. But when something bad happens, you actually just start praying like, hey, to whomever it may concern, please help me. Please get me out of this. That's how we function. And in fact, at some point, most of you in this room, you gave your whole eternity to God. You prayed, you asked him to forgive you, to be part of your life. You got baptized. You gave your whole life, your whole eternity to him. And you did that easily. But when it comes to our stuff and our possessions, We can't give it to God. We struggle with this. And Jesus was so smart because you know that he never actually asked anyone to give him any money. It wasn't about him getting your money. It's about him wanting to get you. That's what it's about. And Jesus was clear. He said, if you haven't surrendered what you have, you haven't really surrendered. You got to surrender all of it, all your stuff, all your possessions, all the things that we hold tightly to. And he addressed this tension head on. This is what he said. And in this moment, he's talking about money and possessions. If you really want to get this right, if you want me to be your Lord, here's the way forward. In Matthew 6, 19, it says this, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And then a few verses later, he goes on in Matthew 6.33, and he says, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And the key there to keeping the pursuit of more out of the driver's seat of our life to prioritize something else first, the key to doing that. It isn't about neglecting our responsibility. We all have bills to pay. You need to take care of your family. You have things that you need to do. But Jesus continues on in in that verse in Matthew 6, 33, and he says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. It's not both and, it's not either or, it's first and second. Because somebody's kingdom has to come first. And Jesus knew that we would eventually figure that out. And the truth is this, when we put ourselves first, you know where we eventually come in? We eventually come in last. When we put ourselves first, we eventually come in last. Because when you put yourself first, you have a hard time saying no to yourself. We're not good at that. And we eventually, we eventually become mastered by this appetite for more. We want more. And no one wants to be mastered by an appetite for more. And it's not what Jesus wanted for us. And here's why. He he created you. You are a created being. And you were created to seek him first. That's the way he created us. And when we get this out of order, our life becomes chaos. It's crazy. But the great news is this. Jesus already had a plan for us. 
He told us we must put something ahead of ourselves When it comes to money, when it comes to stuff, we have to flip the script. We have to flip the script that we were born into because we were born into this script of more of us, right? That's natural for us. American dream, more, more, more. That's how we were born. So the way the script writes for us is first, live. Second, save. Third, give. Me first, me second, God third. That's what's natural to us. And the truth is, if our appetite follows this, and we're always searching for more, we're we're mastered by more, there's nothing left. This is me first living with some leftover giving, right? Whatever I might have left. And honestly, we would say that, like, welcome to average, because that's what most people do. It's how we show up in our giving, And if this life is all there is to life, then yeah, that makes sense. Live that way. But if you believe that Jesus is who he says he is, he is who he claimed to be, then the wisest thing that we can do in this moment is we can flip this script from me first living to seek first living. And here's what that looks like. Looks like first give, second save, third live which is God first, me second, me third. You give first, you save second, and you live on whatever is left. You prioritize something or someone over yourself. And Jesus says that when we do that, that's actually evidence that he's Lord of our life. We've given him our stuff. We've given him our possession. And Jesus was clear, the test of our devotion to God is our willingness to put him and others first when it comes to our money and our possessions. Not just factor him into some equation, but put him first. And for those of you, us in the room who are Jesus followers, I would say this, don't kid yourself. We don't do this well always. And until Jesus is first in your finances, Jesus isn't first. You're not a follower, you're actually just a user. So I want to repeat these words that Jesus gave to us in in Luke 16, 13. He said, no one can save two masters. Either you will hate one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And a lot of times the question becomes this. If I choose to give to God first, how much should I give? What does that look like? And Matt mentioned this last week. That the numbers say that the richer that we get, actually the less we give away. Isn't that crazy? The richer we get, the less we give away. The more extra money we get, the less we view it as extra. And of course, we tell ourselves, that's not true. I mean, I get more, the dollar amount goes up. But in terms of percentages, giving actually goes down. And this tendency, it actually derails our efforts to be good at being rich. And so if you want to guard against what Matt was talking about, the side effects of wealth, you can't, evalu- you can't evaluate your giving in dollars percentages actually give you a better reflection of whether you have control of your money or your money has control of you. And Jesus made this point in Mark 12. I want us to look at that. When he was watching people give, and back in those days, people actually um, gave um, at the front of the room. So not like us. Here when we give, we put some buckets at the back door. We set them on the floor, right? You give on your way out. Maybe somebody sees you. Maybe somebody doesn't. But in this passage in Mark 12 that we're talking about, they actually had the buckets at the front. So people had to walk to the front of the room and they had to drop their offering in the bucket and everybody was watching them. So in this passage, on this particular day, there were rich people who were walking to the front and they're giving large amounts of money, putting them in those buckets. And people are watching. And then their poor people would come up and they would put in what they could. And in this story, there's one elderly woman who walks up to the front to the offering bucket, 
and she gave two small copper coins. And if we were watching that today, and even in that moment, those two small copper coins compared to what the rich people were giving, it probably would have been embarrassing. Some of us, you know when you get embarrassed for someone? We would have felt that for her in that moment. She's in front of everyone, and she's giving two small copper coins. And this woman, she was obviously, she was poor. But after she gave, this is what Jesus said in Mark 12. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything. Everything. All she had to live on. And we think about that story in that passage, and at first you might be thinking, Jesus is just showing favor to someone right, who we all, like, have compassion towards, the little old lady who's walking to the front. I mean, a lot of you can probably picture your grandma shuffling to the front, giving all that she could give, and Jesus is just feeling sorry for her. But the takeaway from this story isn't that Jesus is just kind toward little old ladies. I mean, I think he is. But that's not the point of this story. And I actually love how Andy Stanley's bottom lined this story by saying that the point that Jesus is trying to make is this percentage matters more than the sum. So here's my question for you today What percentage should you give? And I believe that a lot of uh, people would actually say that you need to start with 10% because there's a lot of. Bible scholars, writers that have a lot to say about this idea of the tithe. And that word tithe actually means a tenth. So some people would say you need to give 10%. But the question, what percentage should you give? I'll tell you a little bit of my story. I showed up at this place 30 years ago. I didn't grow up in the church. I had no idea what it meant to, to tithe, to give to the church. You know what my life was? I, I had a dad who had this phrase. Some of you, some of you will recognize this. He said, who, he who dies with the most toys wins. That's what I grew up under. So my idea of giving was like when you pass the offering plate, you don't give a percentage, you don't give an amount. You just grab what's in your pocket, 50 cents, a dollar, whatever's in there, and you just throw it in as it goes by. So when I showed up at this place, that's what I did. That's what we did together. Already said we lived in a tiny 800 square foot house with five kids. We didn't have a lot. So it passed and we'd just give what we had. We didn't know better. And then they started talking about this idea of 10%. And to be honest, we didn't have 10%. And so we just didn't give because it was like if we can't start at 10, then we can't start anywhere. And so we just, we weren't giving. And then eventually God began to work on our heart and through a lot of teaching. It's awkward to teach about money in church. No one likes it but it changed my life for the good. So we started learning. We didn't start at 10%. We didn't have 10%, but we started somewhere. And it's been a journey. And I think we're all on a journey with giving. And I think to find the answer to the question, what percentage do you need to give? Some of you may need to answer another question first. You may need to answer this question. How bad do I want to protect myself from the side effects of wealth? What does that percentage look like? But I would say this, no matter where you start, when you're giving, if you haven't, the important thing is that you start somewhere. Start somewhere. It'll change your life. So this week, I want you to take some time to answer these questions. What's your number? What percentage will you commit to giving back? You can even take a minute right now. If, I, if I'm talking, you've got a number in your head, write it down. If you don't, that's fine. Pray about it. Ask God, what percentage do you want me to give? Make a plan this week. Make a plan to put God first in your finances. I mean, are you willing to flip the script this week to put God first? not just in your words, not in your actions, but actually with your stuff, with your possessions, with your giving. And I know it's a challenge. We're 
live in the American dream, but it's worth it. And I want us to be a church that can impact our community, that doesn't just choose the American dream, that we choose the kingdom dream, because that dream to experience freedom and fulfillment that comes from putting Jesus first in every area of our life, every area, including our stuff, it's worth it. So this week, what percentage, what percentage are you gonna give? I'm gonna pray for us in just a minute, but I wanna remind you guys about a a couple things. Um, Our church has this incredible resource because this is what we don't wanna do. We never wanna stand up here, talk about money, and then just say, figure it out on your own. And so a couple years ago, we invested in a resource. It's called Ramsey Plus. Maybe some of you have heard of it. Maybe some of you are utilizing that. But essentially, we paid for this benefit for all of you. So every single one of you have access to this for free. And what Ramsey Plus does, it just uh, allows you to take a financial peace class. There's classes for parents, for your kids, how to teach your kids to be smart with their money all kinds of opportunities. One of the probably biggest tensions in marriage is money. There's a lot of resources in there for that. So it's free to you guys. Tons of tools in there. So I would say to you, take advantage of it, follow the link, and fight against the side effects of wealth. Let's pray together. God, uh, I'm so thankful. I'm thankful to be in this place today with both of our campuses gathered together. God, just to be reminded this week that we need to give it all to you, all of our stuff, all of our money, all of our possessions, all of our life, God, it all belongs to you. And God, we got to start somewhere, just like we started somewhere in our journey with you, our walk with you, God. So I pray, I pray as a church, God, that we might not get it all right. We might not be at 10%, but God, we just want to start somewhere. And it's all just to to give glory and honor to you, God, to be an impact in our community, for people to look at a church, a group of believers, and just see that, that we put you first, God. That we literally put our money where our mouth is when it comes to you, God. That we trust you with it all. So God, we we love you, thankful for this church, thankful for the impact in our community. And God, I just pray over us today. And we lift all of this up to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, I hope you have an amazing, amazing week. It's been great to be together. We'll see you next Sunday.